look at non-Christian history, in fact, we have like 10 or so uh, non-Christian historical sources that wrote about Jesus within about 150 years of his life. And every single one of the facts we learn from those corroborates something from the New Testament. How important do you think is personal apologetics for people who are listening? Not just that you're an apologist and, uh, and that you like the topic, but that somebody personally dives into their own doubts and fears and questions about their faith. I think it's so vital. I can't, I, it's, it's, you can't exaggerate how important it is that if a doubt pops up or if a question pops up, do not push those things down and ignore it and try to pretend like it's not there. We have to face those things. We have to take those things to the Lord. And God can handle that stuff. And I think that so many people think, again, we talked in the last segment about the, this misunderstanding about the nature of faith. I think some Christians think, man, if I have doubts, if I have questions, it means I don't have a good faith or I'm not a strong Christian or maybe I have a, you know, I, there's something wrong with me. No, there's, there's nothing wrong with you. God gave us minds. He gave us this intellect to think things through. He gave us reason. And, and when we don't use that, that, it can actually end up causing sort of an eruption later of bigger doubts. And then, you know, you watch the video on YouTube where the guy's telling you all the reasons that he doesn't believe anymore, mm -hmm. and, that, and that can take people out. So we have to own our own faith. This can't just be something that we caught from our culture. I, and this is another thing, when you really listen to some of these deconstruction stories, in virtually every single one that I've listened to, and I've listened to a lot of them, you will always see that there, there really isn't a real defined explanation of what their actual faith was for them in the first place. So they'll talk about the church they grew up in. They'll talk about maybe even that they prayed yep. or that they, they didn't want to sin or, or some of these things. But but there's, there's like, is, was there a moment when you realized you're a sinner and you cried out to Jesus to save you from your sins? Yeah. And, and you don't typically that's not there. find that in those stories. You find the, the deconstruction part and the Christian culture part. And I, and I don't mean to downplay anyone's story because there may be somebody out there that, that has something like that, but I listen for that. And mm -hmm. I don't often hear that part of it. Yeah. How do we balance having such a powerful weapon as apologetics, or I shouldn't say weapon, maybe I should say a tool as apologetics, when we're in a back and forth with somebody and, and, and not sort of club them over the head with answers and maintain a spirit of kindness, gentleness, and all of that. How, how important is that, that we just don't go, you know, thug life on them and just <laughs> drop, drop the hammer? Yeah, That's yeah, because apologetics can sound aggressive sometimes. You know, you can look up apologetics online and you'll see debates and people duking out different topics and right. things. But I think ultimately the heart behind why I do it and why so many of my friends do it is because we are truly, this is a saying in apologetics, we don't want to win the argument. We want to win the person mm. to, to Christ. And so there's a lot of creative ways we can do that. And especially in tense conversations when things are getting a little bit heated and blood pressure is going up, it can help to just really become a student so that you can really understand the other person's position. And that requires asking some really good questions. And what I've found is that sometimes asking the right questions can actually annoy annoy the person more than trying to club them over the head with truth because it's really causing them to think that's ultimately what happened to me in that classroom scenario. This pastor had planted these doubts and basically kind of annoyed or irritated that sort of black and white truth thing in me. And it caused me to think much more deeply about what I believed and why I believed it. And so I think that asking really good questions is a great way to diffuse tension in mm. conversations and also to get the other person thinking, but it also puts us in a position to want to learn as well. And it's okay to not know. And that's, I think, the thing people are afraid of, is then sit down with somebody yeah. who's got these big, bolder questions about the, the faith, and they think, well, I don't know this stuff. I won't know how to answer them. And I always tell people, you don't have to be a scholar. You just have to be curious. If you're willing to walk with somebody through their doubts and questions and discover the answers together, what a great way to disciple people. What a great way to grow in your own faith. And then there are people who have those questions for themselves and they're really in in times of doubt and it's just it's really important that we face those things and but doubt kind of can go one way or the other you can actually doubt with the intention of disbelief that's already there unbelief or you can doubt really wanting to know the answers and it's yeah. that's what i would call honest doubt like i want to seek truth and if you're on that lane you're going to be fine yeah what is one question or uh, area of doubt 
that people are really struggling with today, and, and how can we help them with that area? Well, I think it, it has to do with biblical reliability. I think that uh, that if Christians doubt that the Bible is reliable, that mm -hmm. it tells the truth, and that it, we have an accurate copy of it, um, if they if they can doubt that, then it really sort of just destabilizes your whole entire belief system. Because there are things we can know about God, like you mentioned Romans one. There are things we can know about His divine nature just by looking out into creation, but the the actual doctrines like the Trinity and uh, the blood atonement of Jesus, you're not going to get that by looking at a tree. And so we need the Bible. And But if but if, if people are doubting the Bible, then that can cause a, a very much a, a deconstruction and a destabilizing of their faith. So give us some reasons why we can trust that first, that we have an accurate copy of what was originally written. Yeah, well, okay, so this was something that I got really just super nerdy about when I was going through my study time because I just had to get to the bottom of this question. And I learned that there's a, an actual science called textual criticism. Now, this is a science that scholars use to reconstruct the wording of ancient documents when we don't have the originals anymore. So if you've ever read Shakespeare, if you've ever read the Gettysburg Address, you can thank a textual critic because that's how they reconstruct those documents. And so to do good textual criticism, you want to have a lot lot of copies, you want to have a lot of manuscripts, and then you want to have as early and, uh, and reliable manuscripts as you possibly can. And, you know, just a general flyover, because we only have a few minutes here, is that ultimately speaking, the New Testament has more manuscripts to demonstrate its reliability and earlier manuscripts than any other work of ancient classical literature. In fact, it just dwarfs those in comparison. So if we can have confidence that the Bible that we hold in our hands today is an accurate copy translation transmission of what was originally written by the authors, but how do we know that what they wrote was true in the first place. Right, and that's that's kind of the second question when we discover biblical reliability. And there are several different ways to approach this question. We can look at archeological evidence, which just continues to uh, just support facts that are in the New Testament. We can look at non-Christian history. In fact, we have like 10 or so uh, non-Christian historical sources that wrote about Jesus within about 150 years of his life. And every single one of the facts we learn from those corroborates something from the New Testament. We can look at the way historians look at eyewitness testimony. You have four gospels that have all the markings of historical accuracy. They reported embarrassing details about Jesus even, about their, the hero of their faith, where yeah. they record that people thought he was demon possessed and a, that he was a drunkard. And they, they talk about themselves in a way that if you, know, if you were making this up, you, you wouldn't write yeah. these things. I mean, just check social media for proof of that. Nobody, like the, the most you'll see on social media of somebody doing something right. like that is a very cute no makeup selfie where you're just like, you know, yeah. how brave you supermodel. If anything today, <laughs> you see uh, bad guys uh, actually wanting to cover up the bad things that they've done, not sort of willingly expose them to people like you right. see in the New Testament. Right, and even just, for example, one, one point of historical reliability that makes me think that I would not do that if I was making it up, is the fact that they report women being the first eyewitness, uh, t eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection. If you really wanted to make something up in that day and in that culture, you would not have women be the, eyewit the first eyewitnesses to the key event that your whole new belief system is gonna stand or fall on because the testimony of women just wasn't that valuable back then. It's hard for us to understand that now with how far we've come, but uh, back then you, you wouldn't have done that if you were wanting people to buy in on it. So it, it's like, why would you do that? Well, you do it if it's true. So these are, these are tough questions for the critics, and these are the, the kinds of questions through apologetics that, that I believe make the critics start to backslide mm -hmm. and actually uh, start to consider the truth claims of the scriptures. And, and finally, I love how apologetics draws people into conversations so that you and I can eventually navigate them to the message of the gospel, which is the power of God to salvation. Yeah. Apologetics can clear the boulders out of the way. It's the, sometimes the bait that draws the fish. And then as fishers of men, we then reveal uh, the hook of the gospel that can pull them into, into the boat and, and they can be saved and they can know God for who he truly is.
Yeah, that's well put. That's that's exactly right. That's why we do it, right? Yeah. We, we study, it's like an intellectual act of worship for me because I'm not naturally an intellectual, I'm more of a flaky artist, but to study and to help <laughs> people sort of work out some of these doubts is has been so such a satisfying ministry that the Lord dropped in my lap that I never would have dreamed up for myself. Yeah. And it's, it's really like an intellectual act of worship. I love doing that. 